Starting in 1952, the New Hampshire primary has been a significant part of the Democratic and Republican nomination process. While Iowa has held the title as first in the nation caucus since 1972, New Hampshire has been the first in the nation primary even longer. Often hailed for its voters' stark independence, New Hampshire has been the site of serious intra-party drama during many presidential primary cycles. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, Ronald Reagan, just some of the many comeback kids for whom New Hampshire breathed life in the threatened campaigns. At the right moment after poor Iowa performances, the unpredictable voters of New Hampshire gave them all better than expected results. But the New Hampshire primary has also brought doom and dread to several establishment candidacies. Most notably, the political careers of two sitting presidents were effectively ended after New Hampshire primary voters cast their ballots. In 1952, Harry Truman had been in the White House since FDR's death in 1945. He had even survived what many considered certain political defeat at the hands of Republican challenger Thomas E. Dewey in 1949. Nonetheless, like almost every president, his second term was far more difficult than his first. Foremost among his issues was a Korean War dragging on longer than expected, and accusations from Senator McCarthy that his State Department was harboring communists. Furthermore, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefover was leading Senate investigations into Internal Revenue Bureau corruption. As Truman's image as a competent and assiduous executive was being eroded, it was Senator Kefover who decided to challenge him in the 1952 Democratic primary. This challenge started with the New Hampshire primary, where Kefover defeated Truman 19,800 votes to 15,927. The populist senator was on the rise, and Truman soon announced that he would not continue to seek the nomination of the Democratic Party. I shall not be a candidate for re-election. I do not feel that it is my duty to spend another four years in the White House. Truman may have already been on the decline when New Hampshire voted, but his defeat there was the last time he would ever be on a ballot. An eerily similar situation occurred in 1968 when anti-war Senator Eugene McCarthy, through energy and organization, well outperformed expectations in New Hampshire against President Lyndon Johnson. Johnson's 49% to 42% defeat of McCarthy was hardly something to be proud of. The party was deeply divided over the continuation of the Vietnam War, a war which Johnson had started. Despite his legislative achievements, LBJ was bound to Vietnam. The sloppily organized close call in New Hampshire, coupled with his poor health, caused President Johnson to drop. I shall not see. And I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Like Iowa with their caucuses, New Hampshire state law requires that it be the first in the nation primary, a narrative which both parties have followed now for a century since New Hampshire's first primary in 1916. But consider this, in 1952 when Truman lost in New Hampshire to Senator Kefover, the vote total between the two was 35,727. This was roughly 6% of the 1950 New Hampshire population and 0.02% of the American population. Only 19,800 Kefover votes in a tiny northeastern state were enough to sway the sitting president to throw in the towel. This trend has continued into the modern era, giving New Hampshire super inflated influence. 2008 had a particularly large turnout for both Republicans and Democrats in New Hampshire, about 526,000. But that was still only 0.18% of the roughly 300 million people in the USA in 2008. This is not healthy for our democracy. Every four years, political candidates and operatives invade a geographically minuscule, demographically unrepresentative state to pander for months on end, while spending millions on ads. I understand the historical conflict between large and small states dating all the way back to the Constitutional Convention, but why must we constantly make inherently undemocratic rules to appease rural communities? Because of their size, Iowa and New Hampshire give an advantage to underdog and underfunded candidates. Candidates. No one would deny that, but any small state could offer this. The earnest decision making of Iowans and New Hampshire men is appreciated, but also to be expected. It's nice that we moved on from the days where party officials picked delegates at the state conventions or smoked filled back rooms. The fact that any member of either party, and even some independents, can participate in caucuses or primaries in all 50 states is a wonderful thing. But 2020 should be the year when we evolve once more. It is time to have other states start the nomination process. Share this video if you agree, and don't forget to subscribe. Later guys.